today as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ first and foremost and secondly as a pastor. I stand before you today because of the godliness of a woman of God in my life, my grandmother. I stand before you today because at, one, at 17 years of age, after living a life of sin and rebellion, after not even graduating from high school, having dropped out of school in 10th grade, my grandmother never gave up on me. Regardless of how many drinks I had, regardless of how much 
of an addict I was at the time, regardless of my addictions and my issues, my grandma prayed me through. And I want you to know that I stand before you today because of the influence of a godly grandmother and a mother who cared enough when that, when that church van was coming through our neighborhood at Salem, Salem Baptist Church was coming through. My mother made sure that we were on that van. You see, because of a godly grandmother and the influence of a, of a mother that cared, I am who I am. So as we come to know the Lord today, we want to give you an opportunity to equip you. You know, my mother didn't have the tools at the time to tell us about Jesus. She just knew, she just knew in her heart, but that's all. But she made sure when that church van was on, my, me and my sister were on that van. My grandmother knew plenty of the gospel, and it was because she had grown up in church. She was raised in a Christian home. But folks, I want you to know that the best thing you can give is to pass along the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a program called Way of the Master. And folks, in honor of our mothers today, what better thing to do than to equip others to share Jesus with somebody else. You see, we're going to offer an eight-week training course here at Happy Home Church called Way of the Master. The purpose of this is to help us to learn how to share the gospel so that we can tell other people in our neighborhoods, our family and friends about Jesus. And I want you to know it was the tools that my mother and my grandma didn't have. They did a good job with what they had. But I want you to know, folks, that we can see God can use us to share the gospel of Jesus. We can learn how to tell other people about Jesus so that many people can get saved. And I want you to know that we've got a sign-up sheet. We're going to be offering this program right here at church on Wednesday nights. It's going to be done by Kirk Cameron. Y'all remember Kirk Cameron from, from Growing Pains and Ray Comfort. They're a team. We have the training materials right here at the church. It's going to be a video series. It's going to bless your socks off. Hey, don't take my word for it. Why not hear it directly from Kirk Cameron himself? At this time, we'd like to show you a little bit about what this program is going to look like. And we pray that before you leave, you sign up today. Hi, I'm Ray Comfort. And I'm Kirk Cameron. Think of the terrible fate of those you love if they die in their sins. The Bible makes it very clear that without Christ, they'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. What a terrifying thought. What are you doing to reach them? How can you help them see their need for a savior? We've created an exciting and totally unique eight-week training course that will help you to reach them biblically and confidently. This course is based on our award-winning television program, The Way of the Master. It's like nothing you've ever seen. We know that you battle fear, but we're going to show you how to overcome it by giving you a simple, powerfully effective way to make the gospel make sense to the people you care about. And he says that if you will repent of your sin and trust in Jesus to save you, that he will forgive you of your sin and grant you eternal life, not just because you're sorry, but because Jesus paid your fine and now he can let you go. Does that make sense? That makes sense. We'll teach you how to bypass the intellect, the place of argument, and speak directly to the conscience, the place of the knowledge of right and wrong. When you stand before God on Judgment Day, are you going to be innocent or guilty? As of now, guilty. Would you go to heaven or hell? Probably hell. Does that concern you, Amanda? Yeah. You don't have to be an expert in apologetics or archaeology, and you don't have to know Greek. Just let love swallow your fears and follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And we don't just tell you how to share the gospel. We show you through fascinating real-life conversations you get to eavesdrop as we witness to people from all walks of life, gang members, cult members, atheists, intellectuals, on the beach, in parks, on airplanes, and in malls. I think you've changed my outlook though on all of this. Definitely have. Um, you know, makes me wonder if someone is up there. I don't, I don't know. But that's something I'll definitely sit down and reflect on, especially after this. 
Hey, thanks for talking with me, Kishane. I wish you all the best. God bless you. This happened for a reason. I think so, too. Happened for a reason. Right on, man. It's a wake-up call. Have a good day. You, too. Wake-up call. It's simple, it's effective, and biblical. It's what Jesus did. Sign up for the Way of the Master basic training course in your church. Please don't wait. Do it for someone you love. Do it for someone you love. We've got that program right here in our church. And it's an amazing opportunity. I've taken some people through it before in another church that I served. And I want you to know, I I saw and witnessed an an 89-year-old lady lead her first person to Jesus after taking this. I'm I'm serious. It's eight weeks. It's going to be held here on Wednesday nights beginning on the 21st of, of May. May 21st is the first night. You have to sign up. Space is limited. We don't have unlimited space, uh, and, and, I, and I do mean that. So please, so please, th- there's a sign-up sheet that's, on the, um, that's on, on the table out here. Make sure your name gets up there very quickly uh, so that we can make sure we've got some room for you in the class. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be creative. And if you know um, anything about Kirk Cameron, you know how his stuff is. It'll be very, very interesting. A lot of video, and, and it's going to be neat. Anyone ever go through the Way of the Master training before? Anyone ever seen that before? Okay, no one here. Great. So we're in great company. It was tools that my grandma and my mama didn't have, but it's available for us because we care about people. So I guarantee you this is going to change your life. You say, Pastor, what am I going to do about my kids? Well, real simple. We're going to be having a kids program at the same time so that you won't lose any ground there. Sister Tammy... um, is, is running a, a, a program for the children during that time. So it's going to be on Wednesday nights beginning May 21st from 7.30 to 8.30, just one hour. Awesome, innovative way. You won't want to miss it. So with that this morning, we kind of come back to Mother's Day and what's going on. This will probably be the shortest sermon I've ever preached here. And the, it, 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 and it really will be. This will be the shortest sermon um, Ever. The title of this morning's message is called Heads or Tails. Heads or Tails is the name of it. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 3. Or 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. A lot of people don't know about this passage of Scripture. A lot of people aren't even aware of it. But it has to do with Mother's Day. A Mother's Day... Heads or tails is the name of it. Mother's Day, heads or tails. Um, A lot of people, when they're flipping a coin, they'll say the words heads or tails. Now, (laughs) I have before you today two amazing women. Two amazing women are before you. One is not real. (laughs) The other one is very much real. (laughs) The first one lived on a place called Paradise Island. The second one lives in your neighborhood, probably lives in your house. The first one, the first woman here was the type of woman, she didn't need a man. The second one, is glad she has one or wishes she has one because she needs all the help she can get. The first woman here, her emphasis was on her looks. Second woman, interested in her kids. The first woman had an amazing ability to get kids or get people to tell the truth with a golden lasso. The second mama, she just gives them that look and they're forced to tell the truth. The first woman flew around in an invisible jet. The second woman loads her car up and does it by herself many times. The first woman wore stylish clothes, especially in the popular TV series Wonder Woman. The second mama sometimes had to do the best she could 
Sometimes she even had to go as far as making her own clothes. You see, there's a staunch difference between Wonder Woman and the, re the regular mom of today. I wonder if the regular Wonder Woman, I wonder if Wonder Woman back during the hits TV series would be able to manage children like mothers do. I wonder if the original Wonder Woman would be able to sew on a button if she had to. I wonder if the, the, the first Wonder Woman would be able to fly around in an SUV packed with kids' stuff all over the place with a bunch of noisy youngins in the back. But what I often saw on the hit TV series, you would see Wonder Woman flying around on an invisible jet all by herself. Nobody to disrupt her whatsoever. I wonder if the real Wonder Woman isn't the woman that's on the right, that's on the right hand side. I bet if the Wonder Woman, the real Wonder Woman, isn't the mom doing her best to manage everything at once. And the other woman, the other Wonder Woman, is the woman of just someone's imagination. Would the real Wonder Woman please stand up? Would the real Wonder Woman that's got everything going in life at one time please stand up? Let me show you who the real Wonder Woman is. Moms and grandmas, please rise. You know, I was thinking about this a little while ago, and I thought, my first, my first, every little boy's first girlfriend was either Wonder Woman or Daisy Duke. <laughs> I kind of like both of them. <laughs> I kind of had every young man's first girlfriend. Guys, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, all right. Yeah, you know. So we know about that. But you know, I, I was going to say that, but you know what? My first kiss came from my mama. Came from my mama. My first girlfriend was my mama. That's the truth. You are the real Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman spun around in circles and changed. You spin circles in your world. You could spin circles around her. You are the real one. Thank you. In a story today in the Bible, there is a story about a Wonder Woman. And um, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16, listen carefully to this story because it might shock you. Listen carefully because it may surprise you. It says, now two women were harlots. Y'all know what they call harlots around here, don't you? Harlots. Women of the night. Prostitutes. Came to the king and stood before him. And one woman said, Oh my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house. And I give birth while she was in the house. That it happened the third day that after I had given birth, that this woman also gave birth. And we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your maidservant slept and laid her in her bosom and laid her dead son in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to nurse my, my son, there he was dead. But when I examined him in the morning, indeed he was not my son whom I had born. The other woman said, no, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, no, but the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Y'all see what's going on here, don't you? So 
So you have two women, two prostitutes, are living in a house, a prostitute house for women. Both of them are mothers. One mother, one mother by mistake rolled over on her baby at night and the baby died. In the morning, well, d- during the middle of the night, one of the women took and put the dead baby next to the other mother and took the living one and put it next to her. You see that? D- did the old switcheroo here. So that's, so that's what we see. We see the old switcheroo going on. So what happened is, and, and, then, and then they come and they say, hey, no, the, the living baby, that's my baby. And the other woman says, oh, no, that ain't your baby. That's my baby. The dead one's yours. You see what's going on? You could, you, you could see the story, two mothers. Now watch what happens. Verse 23. And the king said, the one says, this is my son who lives, and your son is the dead one. And the other one says, no, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, bring me a sword. The king said, I'm going to fix this. <laughs> Divide the child in two and give half to one and half to the other. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? If y'all can't decide whose baby it is, the king said, I'll just cut it in half and then I'll give you half and you half. That way you each have half half of a baby, right? Doesn't that sound like, doesn't that sound fair? (laughs) Heads or tails, your choice, (laughs) right? (laughs) Now watch this. Thus, the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, oh my Lord, Give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, let me neither mine for yours, but divide him. One mother said, don't do it, she can have it. The other mother said, kill him. Now watch this. So the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is the real mother. Isn't that amazing? So you have two mothers arguing over whose baby it was. So the king says, I'll tell you what, give me a sword, I'll cut the the baby in half, and you can have half, and you can have half. One mother says, oh, don't do it, please don't do it. Just let the other woman have him. Just don't kill him, please. And the other mother says, kill him, it's okay. Who do you think the real mother was? It was the first one, wasn't it? It was the mother that was willing to, to give up her son. I'd like to share with you three things that I see in this passage about mothers. And we're not going to spend a long time on this. Three things. Number one, there's no such thing as a perfect mother. There's no such thing as a perfect mother. Mamas, I want you to have confidence today that you don't have to be perfect. You can do the best you can. And I want you to know, maybe, maybe you're doing the very best you can. There's some things about yourself you'd like to change. Mothers are not perfect. And I want, how do I know this? Because in this passage, I want you to notice what both mothers did for a living. They were both prostitutes. They were both harlots. And you would probably think one is a really good mother. Did you know that I was studying the line of Jesus? And I taught my Sunday school class this this morning. I was studying the line of Jesus, and did you know there are three women in the genealogy of Jesus that have something in common? Did you know there are three prostitutes in the line of Jesus? Read carefully Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 2. Read carefully Matthew's Gospel, because one of them was a woman by the name of Tamar. There was another harlot by the name of... Uh, Bathsheba, and there was another harlot by the name of Rahab. There were three sexually promiscuous women in their past that were mothers, and honestly, they were used of God through the line at which Jesus would come to earth. You do realize that you don't have to be perfect to be a good mom. You don't have to be perfect to be a good mom. I want you to... Ladies, I want you to experience the freedom of knowing that. How many of y'all believe that Jesus turned out pretty good? 
<laughs> you know, I would say Jesus turned out pretty good despite some of the women that he had in his genealogy. Despite some of the women that were in his family tree. Mama, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. The pressure is off. The pressure is off. Ladies, take a big sigh. <sighs> you don't have to be perfect to be a woman of God. And that's what we see here. What we see here is there are no perfect women. I see a woman in this passage that loved her son perfectly, even though she herself was not. There's a second thing that I see in this passage, and that is God cares about the problems that a mother faces. God cares about the problems that mothers face. You see, one of the things that happened, this king was a godly king, was a man of God. And she, and she brought her problem to the man of God who helped find a solution. So the king in his wisdom said, I know what I'll do. I know how to find out who the real mother is. By the way, there was no paternity test. There, are, there was no, you are the mother. There wasn't none of that. There wasn't no paternity test. There was no way to find out. So the king has said, you know what I'll do? I will just go ahead and, and just cut the baby in half, and you can have half, and you can have half. The real mother isn't going to stand for that. The false mother is going to say, well, go ahead and kill it. It's fine, because her baby was dead anyway. But the real mother was going to be filled with compassion, and the real mother was going to say, oh, no, 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 no. You take that baby. You take that baby. You see, God cares. Mamas, God cares about your concerns. God cares. And I remember the night that I was, I remember the night that I had been out drinking all night long. I remember as a 17-year-old, I came home one night. I had been out with my friends and I was drinking Mad Dog the entire night. I was drinking with my friends, just having one bottle after the other. And I remember the night that I finally was able to, was finally able to stumble home after I picked myself up from a big pile of puke. I began to realize that it was time to go home. Somehow, some way, I made it home. And I'm not quite sure how I got there. But I remember the night, and I went and I was walking through the house and I, I didn't think my grandma was still up. All the lights in the house were off and so I thought. So as I started to tiptoe through the living room stumbling around, I remember I could hear my grandmother. I still could hear it to this day. I heard my grandmother praying for me. Praying that God would save me. Praying that God would do something. You see, you see a grandmother's prayer was answered because at, later on at the age of 17, her grandson who she was praying for, who was destined, who was determined himself to be an alcoholic and a drug addict, was going hard down that road but my grandma prayed for me and she stood in the gap and I stand before you today as a preacher as a man of God because my grandmother cared. God cares about your prayers. Grandma, mama you keep on praying and don't stop. God hears your prayers even though it seems like he doesn't. The answer may be just a little ways away you keep believing God, you keep praying, God cares about you and I see this in the scripture I see God care about these women God cares about you there's a third and final thing that I see in this, in this passage number one a mother doesn't have to be perfect these women were prostitutes number two God cares about a mother's problems because, because he put a man of God right there to provide the answer. Mama, Grandma, while you're praying for your youngins, God is dispatching an answer at that very... God's dispatched an answer when you pray. When you dare to pray for your youngins, God has answered that prayer in Jesus' name. You can, you can best bet He has. God will raise somebody up right there to answer that prayer. Finally, the third thing I see in this passage is a mother's love is sacrificial. Mothers will give up their own plans, their own ambitions, in order to do the right thing or the best thing for their kids. How many mothers in this room have gone without because you wanted your children to have you? Mamas, how many of you have gone without, have, you, have, have chosen to say, you know what, Eat your own plans... Even, even, even your own dreams 
have been put on hold at times because you wanted your children to have better than what you had. I would, I, I would dare to say every mama in this house has done that. You see, a mother's love is sacrificial. Mo- the, the, one mother said, you know what? She can have, even though, even though she was, the, the real mother said, just give the other lady the baby because I don't want anything to happen to my son. You see, that's a sacrifice of love, isn't it? The other one was selfish. A mother's love is truly sacrificial. Gives up for others. Hey, listen, don't take my word for it. Why not hear from real mothers with real stories? Any preacher can do that. Any man that's a preacher can stand before you and and talk about it. But there are women whose lives have been touched and changed through being a mother. Um, I've asked two women in our church to share a personal testimony. And um, I'm going to need one of these microphones. Um, Pick whichever one. Okay. All right. I'd like to ask um, uh, Sister Rose. Sister Rose, if she will come now. And uh, Sister Rose is going to share a brief testimony about how how being a mother has changed her life. And you will begin to see... Thank you, Deacon. You will begin to see these qualities manifest. In the second testimony, uh, Sister Carissa is going to share her testimony about how motherhood has impacted her life and what God has shown her. These are two godly women in our church, and we, we give thanks for them. Would you welcome Sister Rose as she comes to share? Deacon Sawyer is coming now, and let me move this back, Ms. Rose. Praise God. Um, just want to say again, Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. I'm here to talk a little while about my mom and what she instilled in me. Uh, I'm from a family, it's 11 in our family. My mom is deceased. I'm the oldest. My mom was a fantastic mom. A mom that was full of faith. A mom that believed in praying. A mom that was full of patience. My mom, she was always in prayer for us. And she always put her needs on the back burner and she was concerned about our needs. A lot of times when we look for mom, she was always somewhere praying in her room, praying, reading her word, and praising, trying to walk in her footsteps. She was a woman that was full of love, that genuine love. And I have no problem with that. I have that also. I instill that in my children. I thank God for my mom. I miss my mom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes you can always call mom, and uh, maybe sometimes when I was going through and I would call mom. And sometimes moms can just say the right words. And when I was going through and I would talk to my mom, she would encourage me. And she would always say, baby, keep praying. You're going to be all right. Just trust God. And I thank her for that. 
That's what I did for my children. I'm doing for my children. I uh, keep them in prayer. My mom kept us in church. I think every time the church doors opened, we were there. And during that time, for a little while, we didn't have transportation. We walked to church, but we were always on time. I said, when I get grown, I will go to church when I get ready. I'm not going every time the doors open. Here I am. And still that same, I brought my children up in church. Uh, I divorced. Single parent, raising three children. It wasn't easy. It took a lot of prayer. I stood with them, even though they wasn't doing the right thing, I continued to pray. No matter what it looked like, I continued to pray for my children. Mothers, never stop praying for your children. I don't care what it looks like. And I have that son. He's the one that gave me the hardest time. <laughs> the hardest time. But not only on Mother's Day, he'll always call me every now and then and let me know that, Mom, I love you. I thank you for standing with me even when I wasn't doing the right thing and believing in me. And all my children, it took a lot of prayer. Sometimes I felt like giving up. I said, God, I can't do this. He said, yes, you can. He said, I'm with you. All of my children are in ministry, working in the ministry. My mom with 11 children, all are saved and working in the ministry. And I thank God for that. It's an honor. It's an honor to stand here and be the mother of three children. And just like I say, I tried to, I tried to walk in my mom's footstep. I taught my kids love. Because my mom always said, love. That's all I heard, love, love, <laughs> love. Regardless of what, regardless of what they do, you continue to love. That's what I've done. And I instilled that in my children. And I thank God for my children. I thank God for my mom. Sometimes these times right here is uh, a little bit hard for me. And this is the first time that I've, I've uh, since my mom been gone, that I had that chance to stand. Thank you for that, Pastor. Thank you. And I'm going to sit down in a few. Um, just want to read this to you. A great mother. A mother always know what to say. A mother is wise. A mother is strong. A mother is someone who guides us to love us no matter what we do with the warm understanding and patience. A mother watches over her children, treasures them with all through the years. The heart of a mother is full of forgiveness for any mistake, big or small, and generous always in helping her family whose needs she has placed above all. A mother can utter, utter words of compassion and make all of our cares fall away. She can brighten a home with the sound of laughter and make life delightful and happy. A mother possess incredible wisdom and wonderful insight and skill in each human heart in that one special corner which only a mother can feel. And this 
It was a scripture in the Psalms that, it was a scripture that my mom stood on wholeheartedly. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his in name. In the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, thy comfort me. Thou prepareth the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointeth my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And I just want to say again, happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers. And you just lay back and relax and let your, your children spoil you this day because this is your day, your special day. I love you. God bless you. And have a blessed day. Wonderful. Amen. Sister Rose has done a great job with her children, and we give we give honor to honor for that in Jesus' name. I had no idea that her her son also played for the Tennessee Titans uh, football team. So uh, very excited about that. I just um, just give the Lord all the thanks and. A good man, it is, wasn't that a powerful testimony? Hey, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till, wait till the next one. All the testimonies of our mothers are incredible. And as we as we move on, we've got another one for you this morning. Hey, they could say it way better than I can. Come on up here, Sister Carissa. Um, it's interesting that um, Miss Rose talked about her mom, and um, what I'm going to talk about is what my children have taught me. Um, I feel like God has taught me lessons through my children and things that they have done and said that I could never have learned in a million years in a Bible college or um, any type of seminary training. Um, I remember when... Um, Trinity was little, and um, I was trying to find a certain pair of shoes to wear to work that morning, and um, I was running late, but I'm always running late, so, um, and I remember Trinity was probably about three years old, and I was like, I just can't, I need to find this other shoe, and she said, Mom, when that happens to me, sometimes I just choose another pair of shoes, so sometimes it's okay if it's not exactly what you think it should be. Maybe God has another plan. And that morning, there was another pair of shoes. I just grabbed those and went on. Um, when Connor, a couple of years ago, I was trying to pull out um, a Virginia creeper vine. And if anybody's ever seen one of those, they can get really tangled up in a bush, and it's very difficult to get them out. And you've got to get every piece or they'll come right back. And, um, and I was under a bush. Um, I had worked at it with the shovel. I had my hands down there digging, and um, Connor was sitting on the other side of the bush. And I remember him looking at me and saying, Mama, you can do it. You've gotten vines like this before. You can do it, Mama. And he's like my coach. If I'm having a hard time doing something, he's going to encourage me to keep trying until I get it done. Um, my children have taught me to be careful what I watch, what I listen to, what I focus on, because what goes in me will come out, and they are the greatest imitators that you have ever seen. Um, uh, my children have taught me to always be honest, um, and if you're not, you need to admit to it. Um, just yesterday, um, Friday had told Trinity that she had to clean her room, and I told her I was going to go check it. Well, Friday night was really busy. I um, hadn't had a chance to check it. Um, Saturday, Saturday afternoon, we're riding our bike. She said, Mom, I color coordinated my closet, organized it. Um, how did you like it? Did you go look at it? And I said, mm-hmm. And Trinity said, how did you like it? I said, Trinity, I, 
that's not true. I really didn't go look at it. She said, Mommy, you just lied. I said, yes, but it's better to admit to it immediately than to pretend like I did and her find out later. But um, I'd, ra I'd rather repent and get forgiveness than to hold on to sin. Um, Connor has taught me that God is big, um, bigger than any of my problems. I remember when he was little. He used to always say, God is so big, his pinky finger must be the size of the biggest building ever built. And that's the picture that he had of God. And Trinity um, would always talk about God was like a puzzle. And the closer that she felt to him, the more clear that the puzzle was to her. And when she felt like she had been disobedient um, or had sinned, she felt like a puzzle piece, a part of him would be covered up. And that was a great picture to me of God, how he reveals little pieces of himself to us. And the closer we get to him, the closer we draw to him, the more he reveals of himself. Um, my children have taught me that I need to lean on and learn from others. There are a lot of awesome women that God has placed in my life um, for the purpose of helping me train up my children in the way that they should go. I think about um, Miss Yvonne and Gwen how they used to rock my babies, and Denise, how they would rock my babies. <laughs> but those women had a heart for my children to be loved and cared for. How Barbie and Amy and Tammy and Debbie and Robin have all had a part in teaching my children about Jesus. And how every time one of you godly women says anything about Jesus, that they're listening and that they're just soaking that up like a sponge, that God has placed all of you in their lives, in my life, because I don't have all the answers. He does. I don't. Um, I think about um, Crystal Kasky said something several months back that really changed my perspective of children. Um, she said, from a biblical perspective, there wasn't, you know, babies, toddlers, um, adolescents, teenagers, then adulthood. That's something that we've created because of our Western perspective. But from a biblical perspective, you're either a child or you're an adult. And I thought, you know, this is not really about stages. It's about teaching Connor and Trinity to be godly men and women. And that's what the goal is. I'm teaching them to be Christ-like, um, not, to, not to be good teenagers. I think kind of sometimes we kind of scaffold their responsibility a little bit, but you really are. You're either a child or you're an adult. Um, the biggest thing that um, God has taught me through my children is to trust in him. Um, I remember when Connor was little and um, when we lived in, our, in the trailer, we had a bar stools and Connor had climbed up onto one of the bar stools and he wanted to get down and he kept looking to see where the next rung was so he could put his foot down. And I said, I said, Connor, just put your foot down. It's there, I promise. And he, I, he kept looking down, and he couldn't step down while he was looking down. And I said, Connor, look at me. Look at me. Mommy's not going to tell you to do something that's going to hurt you. Put your foot down. And um, God spoke to my heart and said, that's what I want you to do. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, look at me. Put your foot down. Trust in me. Look at me. I know where your foot needs to be. Put it down. Um, God is teaching us all the time through every moment, and that's what being a mother has taught me. Um, I did ask um, some friends of mine to tell me what, being a mother had taught them and some of the things that they said 
to slow down and enjoy the little things, to embrace every moment and not always look ahead, but to stay in the moment with your children, with your family. Um, the kind of love that is almost as great as God's for us, grace, patience, joy, precious moments. It's okay to not be perfect, innocent and unbridled creativity to slow down and enjoy life, especially those little moments that seem insignificant at the time, but are really game-changing moments. That you always have a reason to smile, slow down, and enjoy everything. Um, I think my child has taught me the importance of having a childlike faith. Um, that they've given more perspective than ever before the way that Father God loves me unconditionally. Um, and that children are great imitators, so give them something great to imitate. And I just, in thinking about um, being a mother, I thought about the prayer that Jesus prayed for his followers. And I want to pray this over you, and I'd like for you to come into agreement that this is the prayer that you're praying over your own children. Because it says, the ones that you've given me. And whether they're your spiritual children or your natural born children, those are children that God has given you. And you have a responsibility to, number one, be one with Christ. And two, to show them how important it is to be one with Christ. So I'm going to pray this. Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your son so the son in turn may show your bright split. You put him in charge of everything human so that he might give real and eternal life to all in his charge. This is the real eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. I spelled out your character in detail to the children you gave me. They were yours in the first place. Then you gave them to me. And they have now done what you said. They know now beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them. And they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me. For they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours, and yours mine, and my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me so they can be one heart and mind as we are one heart and mind. As long as I was with them, I guarded them in the pursuit of life you gave through me. I even posted a night watch, and not one of them got away. Now I'm returning to you. I'm saying these things in the world's hearing so my people can experience my joy completed in them. I gave them your world, your word. The godless world hated them because of it, because they didn't join the world's ways just as I didn't join the world's ways. I'm not asking that you, that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, concentrated with, consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. I'm consecrating myself for their sakes, so they'll be truth consecrated in their mission. I'm praying not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me because of them and their witness about me. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so they might be one heart and one mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them, so they'll be as unified and together as we are, I in them and you in me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and loved them in the same way you loved me. 
Father, I want those you gave me to be with me right where I am so they can see my glory, the splendor you gave me. Having loved me long before there ever was a world, righteous Father, the world has ever known you, has never known you, but I have known you, and these disciples know that you sent me on this mission. I have made your being known to them, who you are and what you do, and continue to make it known so that your love for me might be in them exactly as I am in them. And that's my prayer that just as Jesus prayed that prayer, and that's from John 17 in the message, that, that the light that Jesus is in me will shine to my children and all those children that God has given me to mother, spiritual or naturally born, that they will truly believe and walk in Christ-like faith. So, mother, spiritual and natural, I bless you today. who have, who are encouraging, who are making spiritual babies. Those are people that, um, that God has put in their charge. When I think of a spiritual mother in our church, I think of Sister Tammy, who is a spiritual mother for many of the young women in our church. She took two of her babies out yesterday to minister to them at a, at, a, at a prayer conference. She spends a lot of time invested in them. No, she didn't give birth to them, but she is responsible for their spiritual care, and she does look after them in Jesus' name. You might say, Pastor, my time of motherhood has passed. Hey, you can always be a spiritual mother to someone else to guide and lead them in the truths of God. You know, I am excited. Aren't you glad? Weren't these testimonies good? Let's give the Lord praise. Wasn't this good? Come on. That's good.